This podcast is brought to you by the Deluxe Edition Network. To find more great shows on our network, head over to the den.show. Hold on to that. Welcome back to the shit show 2.0. Okay, boomer. Damn millennials. Wow. <laughs> Did not know that. Even flirters who who are obviously mentally ill. You want to be my wife? Oh, this is gonna go downhill real quick. <laughs> Is going on and welcome to Take On the World. Lexi and Ali, Ali, podcast therapy dog. That's right. And Mike D. Uh, John could not join us. No, no, he could not. Uh, Love Bug could not join us because Love Bug is a douche. Uh-huh. Um, he, he, he wanted to be here, friend. but he had to work. So, uh, Lexi and I are going to carry on with the. Uh, history of pro wrestling. This will be the more modern history of pro wrestling, starting at the turn of the century. Turn of the century. Um, and this is going to start getting into more of the stuff that uh, mm-hmm. we know. What are you doing, podcast therapy dog? Can you hear me? What's the matter? I am going to my poppy. <laughs> um, I don't know. Now I got the cord wrapped around my neck. I almost died. Come on. No, dude, you got to go. Come here. Tell me, Mama. You gotta stay with Mama. Mess it up everything. You're putting me on the jail. You put me on the jail door. Now I'm in jail. Um, <clears throat> so, we're going to do the modern history of professional wrestling today. Uh, I still have plans on doing some other pro wrestling stuff. I wish Love Book could be here, but he cannot. So, um, just a reminder, check us out on the den.show. For uh, not only our awesome, great podcast, but other great podcasts like um, Horsing Around. I was just about to say that. The Red Horse Podcast. Um, that's the podcast of the month for December. Um, so check them out. They do some funny stuff. I enjoy listening to them. I was listening to them yesterday. I actually listened to two shows that I already listened to. So, yeah, guys, a couple guys just having fun and and speaking in mind, which is cool. Yeah, that's cool. Plus, they gave us a nice shout out last month. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we appreciate. It. So, uh, what are you drinking there? You got two drinks. I made my like a true alcoholic. <laughs> I made my own gin this past week. I made two different kinds. Uh, it was a kit that my best friend got me for Christmas. And it was so awesome. And the gins are pretty good. They're pretty mild, I would say. It just tells you to use like a high quality vodka for your base, which is why it's a little bit smoother, I think. Um, there's a traditional style gin and a colorful gin, which is why it has a little bit of a red hue. I used um, two parts of the uh, the traditional gin and then one of the colorful gin which has a little bit of lavender and hibiscus in it which is why it's red um and then the other drink that i have is the harpoon duncan pumpkin here which is a limited edition and i don't think i've tried this one yet a limited release rather i have the very last of my north carolina uh hummingbird heels i Munich am golden lager i am going to north carolina next month and I also have my left hand double milk stout. Which, of course, is delicious. So, um, let's just jump into it. So, when last we ended with uh, Love Bug. Oh, I had COVID last time, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> I still had COVID last time you guys recorded. That's why I wasn't here. She's all recovered now. All recovered and, and all good. I was like, wait, why wasn't I here? I literally got my mask on, I hand sanitized, and I came out to let Ali out, and I heard somebody in the kitchen, and I just assumed it was John, so I ignored them. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say I had a love bug. Didn't even realize that he was here. 
I was just like, why does John have a weird car today? <laughs> so, I was out of it. But feeling better now. Feeling better. Good. Now I can continue and get on get in on the wrestling action. Yeah, because uh, uh, maybe people don't know this, but Lexi is a wrestling fan. I do like wrestling. I Well, I, I don't think I really had a choice. <laughs> You did? I never forced you. No, but like, it's just one of those things. Like, you just grow up around it. Yeah. Why wouldn't, why don't you like it? Why wouldn't you like it? It's fun. I like watching shows. So, uh, Lovebug and I got to 1906. Okay. With, uh, Stanilius Zabisco, which is, was the namesake for Larry Zabisco. He took that name on as, a uh, an homage. Okay. To, uh, a former great, uh, world Roman Greco wrestler who turned to a professional wrestler. So uh, in 1908 uh, the first NWA world champion Orville Brown was born in Cedar Township, Kansas. Okay. So uh, Orville Brown when we get into more of uh, NWA and and that sort of stuff, his name will be a a reoccurring theme. Uh, Also uh, going on to 1914. Oh, 1910 is what I want to talk about. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> 1910, uh, there's a couple of wrestling promoters. Uh, I don't know who they are. I, I have their names here, but I, I didn't know. Them. Yeah, I don't. So it was John McBray, or Maybray. Maybray. Yeah. Joe Carroll and Burt Warner, not Kurt Warner. <laughs> uh, no connection. Uh, the McBray gang. Uh, they were indicted in federal court for fixing wrestling matches via the U.S. mail. So this is like the first notation um, of... Excuse me, Vince McMahon, you're going to jail. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to jail for, for scripting. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, this is the first the first place where... That kind of comes in, it seems like. Where it, now, they do, they do say that the entertainment portion of it came in long before this. But um, this is the first place. And, and it was a criminal thing. Yeah. Like, that's how serious people took wrestling back then. Even though people, even now, know it's entertainment. Mm-hmm. And if you don't know, it's fucking entertainment. Yeah. It is. Uh, it's not fake. No. It's entertainment. It's entertainment. But, I mean... It's not fake at all. Like it's almost like how like uh, like stunt doubles in movies actually have to do the stunts. Yeah. So uh, they were indicted. I don't know what what the outcome of the the, the indictment was. Obviously, doesn't really matter. Yeah. <laughs> but I just wanted to point out that even back that far, uh, it was serious. It was serious stuff. Like people took it very seriously. So 1914, Vince McMahon Senior was born. Whew. Uh. 1915 to 1920, uh, the wrestling, it, it's like it is now. It, it, like the popularity was in, in, in a tailspin. Like yeah, the popularity of wrestling from in, in those years were, I think the American public was just uh, focused on other things. Um, 1920. Yeah, probably. <laughs> There's a lot going on in in the olden times in the mid 1900s. And there was a lot of because of of some of the indictments that were handed down. There was, you know, the, the American public kind of, I guess, felt kind of duped by the sport. Uh, they doubted the legitimacy and the status of competitive sport as a competitive sport. Right. Um, You had guys like Frank Gotch, who who retired in 1913. And uh, last time we talked about Frank Gotch, and I, I remember the name, um, he was, like, they were a legitimate wrestler. He was a legitimate wrestler mm-hmm. and started doing professional wrestling uh, as a spectacle at, like, carnivals and stuff like that. Um, so he retired, and, like, there were no new superstars to fill that void. Like there were no big names like Frank Gotch or Farmer Burns to to take up the mantle that that they had built up. Um, so in the twenties, uh, three men 
and they ended up calling these these guys the Gold Dust Trio. It was uh, okay. I don't know if that was where it came from, but that would be interesting to to, to know that history. Yeah. If Gold Dust came from from this, if there's some kind of connection, yeah, like an homage uh, or something. So Ed Lewis, uh, Billy Sandow, and I don't know who the third guy was because I deleted it. Oops. Anyway, the three guys, the Gold Dust Trio, uh, formed their own promotion in the 1920s, and they modified the in-ring product to attract fans. Um, so they were using more flashy holds. Uh, the first use of time limits in matches was during this time. Uh, the signature finishing moves started. So the showmanship was being one up at this time. Uh, they also popularized uh, tag team wrestling, and thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, introduced new tactics such as distracting the referee, which made the matches more exciting. Uh, just a, a different way to for the wrestlers in the ring to sell this entertainment to the fans. So rather than paying uh, wrestlers who were traveling through the area on certain dates, uh, they were putting them under contract, basically. They they were, uh, which when they put them under these contracts or agreements, uh, it gave them the opportunity to form more longer term angles, which is what you see today. Right, and that's like essentially what all the big promotions now do. Like that's like their game is playing with contracts. But and there there was some smaller promotions when when I was wrestling that did the same thing. Uh, they did. There were some promotions that were smaller that were doing that. When you were starting out, that are now bigger promotions still doing that. Yeah. But, uh, Lovebug and I never got, uh, pigeonholed into that. Yeah. Uh, we continued to be independent. Uh, there were places where we worked every month, but we just didn't go under contract. We were offered contracts right, places, like free but, land. but it, you couldn't make a living doing that. Right. Um, so anyway, in the late twenties, uh, there was a, they had success with the more worked aspects of professional wrestling in America, uh, gimmickry, submission holds. And everybody who's been around the business, everything's a gimmick in the business. It's a gimmick. Gimmicks a thing. It's a thing. Things a gimmick. Like your 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 outfits, your gimmick, your persona, your gimmick. You can. Uh, do something in the ring and it be your gimmick. Yeah. Uh, so, like, it's just one of those terms that like we use. Part of your gimmick is is also kind of like your signature move. Yeah. You, like, build that into your entire persona that you're in the ring with. Wait, like, like here they're, they're saying the submission holds and finisher moves were incepted in the 20s. And you built the whole match around working up to that. Right. And you could, you know, you could tease that and, and make that. More entertaining. Uh, so let's see. Uh, okay, the uh, an amateur wrestler named Sir Athel Oakley got together with fellow grappler Henry Arslinger, Icelinger, Earslinger, 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 to launch one of the first promotions to employ the new style of wrestling named All In Wrestling. All In. Yeah, and I, I think. It's just an expansion of catch as catch can style, right? Um, so the the demand for wrestling started going up. The, the popularity increased. Uh, there wasn't enough skilled amateur wrestlers to go around, so many the promotions switched to more violent styles because that's what some people wanted to see with weapons, chair shots. Um, yeah. Women wrestlers, mud-filled rings became commonplace, uh, especially in the 30s. Uh, in, in the 30s, uh, London County Council banned professional wrestling. <laughs> uh, and it left the business, again, in, in rough shape just before World War II. So World War II came, and uh, there, there was a lot of... Uh, a lot of need to cheer people up at home. So after yeah. World War II started, wrestling started making an insurgent, insurgent, not an insurgent. 
like, I wonder if that was, you know, even kind of difficult. Then, like, did it turn mostly to, like, email wrestlers or, like, how did that work? Because everybody's also getting drafted. I think you had some of that, but uh, with more women at home than men, uh, I, I think still at that time, the female wrestlers were just looked at as, like, pieces of meat in a ring. Yeah, that's... So women wouldn't go see that, but... uh you know, certain men would. Right. Uh, and I think it wasn't as sex symbol as it was in the 80s and 90s. Right. And that, and I think that's so important because I don't think wrestling would be very big if, that's, if that was, like, the main drive for it in the time. Because people were still very, like, long skirts, you can't show above your knee. And you can't show your ankles. Can't, yeah, yeah, like, things were still like that, so I feel like it couldn't be too risky, otherwise I, I feel like it probably, at that point, would have had a large chance of just being shut down. Yeah. I, like, I, alcohol. I agree, yeah. Um, 1925, the new Madison Square Garden building was built in New York. Uh, it's not located in the same place that it was before. Now, Bob and I talked about this a little bit, um, and I'm just going to throw go a little throwback here. P.T. Barnum built a, a, a hippodrome, and that was eventually bought by uh, someone who made it um, into a garden. It was something gardens. Uh, I can't remember the guy's name. Probably just scroll back. Uh, not Madison Square. No, it was... Uh, geez. What the heck was his name? Gilmore. Gilmore Gardens. Okay. Uh, and then Vanderbilt bought Gilmore Gardens and built the first Madison Square Gardens, and it was rebuilt twice after that. And then... Elsewhere? Uh, it was moved, and then it was moved again. Okay. So now you're at where Madison Square Gardens... Is now. No. It's still not the same spot. Oh, God. Um, it's not. It's still not the location that it is now. So it might have still been the same location as... Uh, when it was just rebuilt. Gilmore Gardens, or, right. or when it was just rebuilt. When Vanderbilt rebuilt it. So, um... Oh, no, it's not in the same area as the first two, so it might be the one that it's in now. Okay. Um, Maximum capacity was less than 20K. Yeah, 18,496. Oh, that's so small. Yeah. Uh, in 1925, Jess McMahon with Tex Rickard began promoting boxing matches at Madison Square Garden with uh, the light heavyweight championship match between Jack Delaney and Paul Berlinbach. Uh, around that same time, um, you started seeing uh, professional wrestling matches all the time there, and then you you would they would basically have the professional wrestling matches every couple weeks, every two weeks, and then once every two months have a big boxing. Uh, so those those two the, the boxing matches they started that would be the roots of what in 1952 would become Capital Wrestling Corporation, which was started by Vince McMahon. grandson of Jeff McMahon and to- Toots Monts, who was a wrestler. And I, as we go through here, I'm going to flash up some of their pictures because I have a picture of this to- Toots Monts who was a wrestler. I don't know. He, he didn't look French, but I couldn't hear his voice in the picture. <laughs> uh, so that Capital Wrestling Corporation would go through several name changes and now then become the now WWE. Right. Which I, I want to follow the full history of that because there's a long sordid history there. Uh, in 1930, uh, the National Wrestling Association was founded in New Orleans and their champion was a young Luthez. So, uh, even if you don't know who Luthez is, you have seen modern wrestlers do a Fez press. Absolutely. Um, the association was eventually brought into the National Wrestling Alliance, which was founded in 1948. Uh, but for 18 years, they held their own. Right. Well, for 74 years, the NWA has been around. 
right. in one form or another. And it, it's a shell of what it used to be because the NWA used to be bigger than anything. Than anything. It was all the territories, which we have a little picture of all the territories here. If I could find it, I'll flash it up. But uh, there was very little overlap between these territories where uh, it was very, very competitive. It was very competitive, and the territory <laughs> system was was basically this is where you stay, know your place. Yeah, this is basically what's that called when they change the lines of the voting? Gerrymandering. Ger- yeah, this is pretty much gerrymandering. Yeah, <laughs> like look at some of these. Sh- like what's this? This this one up in the corner here. The one that, that has the scratches to it. Yeah, like, that's where they overlap. I know, but I just like the yeah. the orange one next to it, the red one. Those are. This is ridiculous. We don't need two there. Well, it's Canada, so it didn't matter. Still. But, and and you have to think now, too, It's it was it was still like that up through the early 2000s. And in the indies, some of the indie promoters, because I was an independent promoter for quite some time, some of the independent promoters still believe it to be that way. Yes, like they still treat it that way. They're still like... Very territorial. Yes. And, uh... You know, the, the problem is, is instead of working together with other people, everybody wants to cut everybody else's knees out. We had people, a, a promotion that was much bigger than ours, uh, found out when we were having a show and ran their show the very same day, like three miles away. Yeah. And uh, we packed the house and they had 30 people at their show. Oop. So, you know, it, it backfired on them. But it, I was probably there. They heard it was a gauntlet thrown down between us, and I, I went and talked to him. I said, "Look, I'm not trying to compete with you. Yeah, do your thing. Yeah, by all means, do your thing. If if you want, if you want me to hook you up with some of the guys that come in and work with us, that's cool. Run your own angles. Do your thing. Don't care. Yeah, you know, just let us do our thing. Yeah, and because people don't want to do that. After talking to him, things got better, but uh, there was still animosity, not on my part, because I never tried to compete with anybody when we were doing it. Yeah. And, and that's what they were doing at this time, even though, uh, because a lot of these territories were part of the NWA, yeah. in one way or another, there was a loose, there was a lot of ego, uh, between the promotions and they wanted their guy to be the NWA champion and blah, blah, blah. So, and we're going to get to that, but it, it got ugly. So the Orville Brown, who I talked about in 1908, mm-hmm. uh, he um, he won the National Wrestling Alliance World Title from Sonny Myers in Des Moines, Iowa, in 1948. Uh, Pinky George and other regional promoters form a version of the National Wrestling Alliance that rose to become one of the most powerful wrestling bodies in the world. Uh, and they gave recognition, the recognition of world champion to Orville Brown. Um. Even though they're only national, they gave him the world champion. Well, right. (laughs) Because in America, everything we do is... It's the world. It's the best of the world. So, um... The the like-minded promoters that joined this NWA uh, agreed upon a world champion. And they would join forces with Pinky George, Orville Brown, uh, Tony said, uh, I should say where they're at. Iowa's Pinky George. Kansas is Orville Brown. Chicago's Tony Stretcher. Ohio's Al Half and Harry Light. Um, and they became the governing body of the National Wrestling Alliance. Uh, a few weeks after, it was agreed that Orville Brown, who was still an active wrestler, would assume the mantle of the heavyweight champion. It was decreed new territories were brought into the National Wrestling Alliance. And a world heavyweight champion would have a unification title match and absorb when 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 they when these new uh, territories were brought into the National Wrestling Alliance, they would take their champion and they would have the world champion have a match. Right. And, and that's how they would absorb a in. So that champion would become part of part of the thing. Uh, so it's almost like the brand split. Yes. It's it's a it's a lot like it's a lot like what's going on now. Yeah. Uh yeah, that is honestly what's kind of happening. Uh five hundred and one days 
or where Brown was NWA world champion? Week. I don't want to jump ahead at all by any means. Call me Lexi Leap ahead if you must. But I know somebody who held the title longer. I do too. Someone we shall talk about in our next episode. <laughs> um, so very impressive though. Like five five hundred days is almost two, almost two years, which is insane. It pales in comparison to what they do now. Yeah. But when you think about it, like to have a title for over a year is pretty crazy. When at least quarterly you're defending it in some giant match. Yeah. So. The next opponent would be another NWA world champion from a different promotion from the National Wrestling Association out of New Orleans, which was founded in 1930. And their champion was Bufet. So uh, just before they had this unification match, uh, Brown suffered a career-ending injury in a car crash and had to forfeit the title. And they just handed the title to Bufet then. So he was carrying the banner from uh, uh, 1949 to 1956. That's fucking insane. 2,300 days. Conquering all the territories and uniting the uh, National Wrestling Alliance like no no other person before or after him. I mean, he had it for almost eight years. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's insane. Uh. He, was, it's, he defeated oh, he defeated Gorgeous George for the Boston World title in 1950. Uh, Baron Michel, Michel, Michel Lyon for the Los Angeles World title in 52. Yeah. And these were the two biggest rivals of the NWA. And by winning these two titles, it absorbed them into the NWA. And it, it is now the dominant thing. Yeah. Like there's somebody... A- from every part of the country, a part of the thing. Well, here's here, that's Lexi Leap ahead. Uh, Lexi, right on time. <laughs> Alexi arrives precisely when she means to. Right on time. How fortuitous! Uh, throughout the fifties and sixties, uh, more promoters joined with the National Wrestling Alliance, including Don Owens of Pacific Northwest in Oregon. Which, yeah, that's they're on the the sheet here. Um, I see him, Frank oh. Tunney. From Maple Leaf Wrestling. He's down here. Uh, it's Toronto. Okay. Bob Geigel from Central States, Kansas. Uh, Fritz Von Erich, which is big time wrestling. WCCW in Texas. Uh, Wally Carbo from Minnesota. Eddie Graham from Florida. Stu Hart, which is, if anybody's heard anything about pro wrestling, everybody knows the name Stu Hart. Uh, it's Wildcat Stampede, Calgary. Uh, Ron she- or Roy Shear, San Francisco, Gene LaBelle from Los Angeles, Dory Funk from Texas, again, another uh, grandfather of wrestling, uh, the Funk family, uh, Joe Blanchard from San Antonio, another big name in, in wrestling, Jim Crockett, another big name in wrestling, uh, he's mid-Atlantic Carolinas, and the, the, the Crockett properties, or Crockett promotions, um, my God, there were so many, but they were all called the Cro- Jim Crockett Promotions. Yeah. Uh, Vince McMahon Sr., uh, Toots Mott. <laughs> uh, Suck it, Vince Capital McMahon Wrestling uh, slash WWE, WWF, New York. Uh, Jim Barnett from Georgia. Uh, Giant Bubba from All Japan. Oh, wow. All Japan. Yeah. Back then, yes, they were having people from Japan over here. Uh, yeah, we we sent we sent uh, actually we talked about it in the last thing. Uh, we sent like this these ten or fifteen wrestlers over there. They had these super cards set up. Mm-hmm. The first one sold out, and then nothing. So they canceled the rest of the tour. That sucks. Yeah, but the Japanese style of wrestling and I love it. What what the fans want over there are much different than what they want here. Yeah. They, a lot, I feel like a lot of, um, not all or many, but I would say like a, I feel like compared to the Japanese wrestlers that you see today, a lot of 
American wrestlers are more technical. Okay. You know what I mean? Like, they do a lot of, like, high, they're almost like luchadors. Like, they have more of a lucha style. Yes. And. It's called strong style. Strong style, which is, of course. Fuck it out. <laughs> Some of my least favorite wrestlers are also from Japan. <laughs> So. so anybody who really is a smart mark or has been in around uh, around the wrestling business will know that there's so many egos in, in the wrestling business. And uh, title disputes started to raise their ugly heads, causing the end of, of WA to start to splinter. I just don't see how you could dispute any of that. <laughs> who holds the title? Hmm. Well, here you go. You died. That's the end of the game for you, not you. Edward Carpenter won over Lou Fez in 1957. Uh, the victory was overruled because Fez withdrew mid-match due to injury, but NWA ruled the title couldn't change due to injury. So Which was, makes sense. There was, but there was shenanigans. It was a rule change. It was buying car insurance after the accident. Right, and I mean, like, to be fair, you're not going to know what to do in that situation until it happens. And it's like, well, you didn't really win in the competition for this, so it's not really fair to give it to you, is how I feel about it. <laughs> and I don't I don't dispute that. No, but it's like, mm, you don't really get to say that now. You, you, you should have said that before. You should have said it before, and, and now you got to live with the consequences of you not saying it. So Los Angeles World Wrestling Associates withdrew uh, recognition and crowned Comp- Carpenter as the first WWA World Heavyweight Champion. The WWA would fold in 1968. Uh, in 19- Insane. <laughs> in 1960, Vern Imagine. Gagne was also uh, slighted out of a title, caused Wally Carbo to withdraw from the National Wrestling Alliance, and together with Ga- Gagne started AWA. Gagne. No, oh, Gagne. I know. <laughs> I would have pronounced it <laughs> Gagne if I did not know the name. I think. It's Edward Carpentier. What? I think his last name is Carpentier. Uh, Carpenter. <laughs> Carpentier. Yeah, Carpentier, maybe. Um, <laughs> anyway. I just, I, since we're talking about names, that's what I've been thinking since I saw the name. Okay. <laughs> uh, AWA, when I was young, was one of my favorite wrestling organizations. When you were young, he- back in the... 1960s? Yeah. 70s. <laughs> when, uh... Don't be disrespectful. When the first Scooby-Doo's premiered oh, in Black here and White. Here we go, here we go. <laughs> uh, that was 1969. I was not born yet. Yet. Um, <laughs> no, they weren't black and white. They weren't black and white. They were in color. Were they? Uh, the AWA, uh, even now, when I come across them on, um, like, some of the streaming services, I love watching the old AWA matches. Yeah. I like watching old matches. I especially like watching, like, WWF matches. Because that's what I grew up with. That's what I remember watching as a kid. So the that's Attitude what, Era. Attitude Era. Ruthless Aggression. They were very good. They were, I, I feel like... And I know it's because, like, that's when I grew up and that's what I know. But for me, that was, like, peak wrestling. Yeah. Well, it, it was... The, the 80s and 90s for the business, I think, were, were the boom. Yeah, they were and, like the best. And we'll get to why. We're almost there. Why I thought so. We're almost there. Uh, 1963, the NWA World Champion, Nature Boy, Buddy Rogers. Nature Boy. Was defeated by Luthez. Uh, but Vince Sr. and Mott's Tooth refused to acknowledge a change. Instead, withdrew Capital Wrestling. Uh, and which is... At this time, it, by 63, was the Worldwide Wrestling Federation, WWWF. We, um, later, we later figure out that worldwide is one world, one word. <laughs> do we? It's because they take out the third W. Well, they just call it world. I know, but I never called it that. No. I always called it Worldwide Wrestling Federation. And I don't know why, because I don't think that I ever knew it as no. the Worldwide Wrestling Federation. I was going to say, how would you even know that? But worldwide is one word, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> so. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, let's see they, so they withdrew from the National Wrestling Alliance crowned Rogers the inaugural WWF world champion which is hilarious because they were just mad that, that 
the NWA did that, and now they're doing it. Yeah. This is... Goodness gracious, here it goes. Here it so, starts. Yeah, I know. It, it's just... So early. Despite losing those three big promotions, they were huge. They were three of the biggest. Um, and all three of them went on to create national wrestling promotions. Uh, despite losing these three promotions, NWA continued to thrive. Uh, and the NWA World Heavyweight Championship was still considered the most prestigious title in the world. Uh, it, what was it called? The, something, something pounds of gold or something like that. I think I have it in here someplace. Pounds of gold. Oh, but, how much was in it? The, the, the uh, belt was called that. Oh, okay. I, I, I had to find it. Okay, okay. Um, so, uh, in 1971, Bruno San Martino left and rejoined uh, the NWA, uh, it, which kind of left uh, WWF like reeling a little bit. But they were kind of lucky, and they rebounded after Andre the Giant became the top star of the company in 1973. So now we're getting into names that Andre most people will also. know, regardless. Uh, throughout the st- uh, throughout the 70s. The NWA continued to be the standard bearer uh, with world champions like Harley Race, Dusty Rhodes, and Terry Funk. Oh, wearing the 10 pounds of gold. 10 pounds of gold. There you go. And I also want to say, while I was looking this up, uh, the longest reign is still Luthez. Yes. But the most reigns is Ric Flair with 10. Yeah. The 10 time, 10 time, 10 time, 10 time. Um, Rick Flair used to be so good. <laughs> by the end of the seventies, even the WWF returned to the NWA fold. I wonder why. And WWF was reduced to a regional championship status uh, wow, wow. during Bob Backlund's first run. Now, a little side note: Do, do they still consider it the WWF World Championship run, even though it was a regional championship at that point? Because he still won that championship. It's still the same thing. But they just had to change it because... Yeah, I don't know. That's weird. Anyway. I don't know. Uh, the side note was, I've met Bob Backlund. Yeah. And when I was in the 70s growing up watching wrestling, I loved Bob Backlund. When did you meet him? I thought he was the the, the, the freaking bee's knees. And when I met him, he was such a dick. I met him at an EWF show. <laughs> And I almost got to work him, and I'm glad I didn't because he was just a douche. And, um, you know, you, you tend to, as a wrestler, when, when what we call the names, the, the, these old timers come into the locker room, show them the utmost respect because mm-hmm. they've been to the show and you're not. Yeah. But he was just a dick to everyone. He actually was not a dick to me, but I didn't like the way he was treating everybody else. Right. And it's like, eh, I don't really like that. Like, you, what, you like me because I think you're really cool. And I don't know. Like, what did I do? Right. What did everybody else do? And, like, some of the guys that I met, um, I won't name drop, but uh, we went into a promotion in Delaware. And when the guy saw, this guy has wrestled for one of the national organizations, was very popular. He saw us, and actually, uh, he was with Sonny. Remember Sonny? From the, the late 80s? I don't remember. She was actually locked up in Carbon County Jail. Ooh, so fun! <laughs> anyway, him and Sonny came over to me and Lovebug, stopped what they were doing, came over, introduced themselves to us, and, you know, hey, hey it's good. Great to meet you. I've heard a lot about you guys. I've, so awesome. I've been seeing, you know, seeing you guys and, and, and this and that. And, and he was just so respectful. He didn't need to be. No. He could have just came over, shook our hands, said, hey, nice to meet you, and walked away. Right. But he gushed over us, invited us back to their place to party after the show, which we did not do because I know there was drugs involved. Well, in Carbon County Prison for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> well, they lived, they lived in Jersey. Uh, but anyway, it was just cool. Yeah. No, that's, I agree. That's really cool. So, in 79, Vince Jr., who had been working for his father for a few years, took over the day-to-day operations of WWF and changed it to WWF. He's like that extra W? Too much. It's gone. It's gone. It doesn't roll with the tongue. It does not. 
Okay, and this is why I'm wondering because the title their, name changed. Their whole dispute with the Wildlife Federation was that they were the Worldwide Wildlife Federation. Not, I I have all the inside track on that story. I don't know if I've ever told you. No. Okay. Uh, should we do it now? <laughs> should we do it now? When is we... when is it? No, it's going to happen soon. We'll, we'll we'll tell it twice. I, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you what happened. So, uh, the WWF mm-hmm. in the '90s had gotten so big, and they were trying to shut everybody else out of the wrestling business. Yes. Uh, they were buying up WCW. They bought up ECW. I remember that. And and I think that's the darkest time of professional wrestling because there's no longer any competition. And this is. This is after, like, all these, you know, like, disputes and stuff have already done so well for them. Yes. They've used them as, you know, like, a backer board. Like, they've bounced off of them. They've done fun stuff. Did the name change happen before or after the fucking tank? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I don't honestly remember exactly I can't where remember happened. where that happened. Like, who was that? Wasn't that ECW? So it had to have happened before they... Bought them. You know, we work for EWF. Yes. Eastern Wrestling Federation. Yes. And Eastern Wrestling Federation got a cease and desist order from the WWF. Sure. That they could no longer use the WF as it was trademarked to them. Oh, shit. They fucked up. Because they, fucked up. they were using the words Wrestling Federation. And uh, Taylor Swift is in a lawsuit about this for haters going to hate, players going to play. Really? Yes. Because somebody tried to sue her. And said, you can't use these. It was, uh, I don't remember if it was a TLC or Destiny's Child song, something like that. One of those, like, R&B artists from, like, the early 90s. And they were like, you can't use this. This was our song. You took this from our song. And her legal team argued, this is a common phrase. You can't, like, you can't sue us over using a common phrase. Right. And then Taylor Swift (laughs) trademarked them. (laughs) <laughs> and the courts just ruled that she has to she has to go through with the, the court hearing that they're not gonna they, she has to that's funny yeah like she she literally just did the exact same thing so it's so funny just to be like they just backed themselves in an old corner I know it so if you look at the 80s logo for the WWF yes it is you cannot distinguish it from the World Wildlife Fund really it looks the same it's blocky letters yeah uh, the only thing is World Wildlife Fund eventually put a panda behind it. Which, but World Wildlife Fund actually had the trademark and copyright for WWF. So when they found out what Vince was doing, uh, yeah. sending a cease and desist order, all these promotions, they were like the mm-hmm. WWF, the World Wildlife Fund had given them limited use permission to use the the logo because it didn't compete with them. Mm-hmm. Um, they turned around and said, "We're." Absolutely getting this. We're lifting that now. Yeah. You no longer have the rights to use WWF. You know, if that's the way you want to be with other people, we're going to do the same thing you did to them. And that's when they changed the WWE. And they made it sound like it was a rebranding. And it was well, they had to. Because they had no choice. They had no choice. Vince fucked up. They had, they had no leg to stand on. And they <sighs> thought that they could just get away with it because they were in, not in competition with World Wildlife Fund at all. No, but, but it's like, well. You know what? If you're going to be a dick. To these other people who really not like EWF was no competition to them. Absolutely not. And the guys That's, from uh, the guys from EWF said, "Look, we can't fight this. We don't have that kind of money. Yeah. We're just a, a indie wrestling promotion." Right. So they just changed their name. They changed their name to something that had no WF in it at all. That sucks. So that right. that that was always an interesting story because, like, when people say, "I wonder why they changed it now," I said, "Well, let me tell you. Let because me tell you. I have some firsthand knowledge." That's I honestly I respect the um, the Wildlife Federation more now. The Wildlife Federation, the Wildlife Fund <laughs> more now. Yeah, because like before, like when you just like the World Wildlife WWE, Federation is that where they have animals fight? <laughs> God, that's so illegal. <laughs> Peta's gonna cancel us. I cancel Peta anyway. I'm sure Peta's Peta's. Pizza's. <laughs> I'm sure Peta's already canceled me. Peta's. Anyway, I talk about uh, meat therapy <laughs> almost every podcast. Uh, there's 
there's a lot of good jokes about PETA that we're not going to go into, but I, I, I kind of have, like, a better respect for them now, because not knowing the situation, you're just kind of like, well, it's stupid. Like, why did they make them change their name? It worked so much better. Yeah. Like, WWF is so much better than WWE. As soon as they changed their name, things just started going downhill. Uh, it was because they, they tried to shut like, down Yeah, all they tried to take everybody else out. Like, so there's no more fun. The 80s were a boom for wrestling. Pinnacle. Uh, Vince took the... Con- you could say what you want about Vince McMahon. A lot of things can be said about him. But when it came to the operation of the WWF, it, and when he took over... He went from a national organization to an international organization. Yeah. And he he created the wrestling boom. Mm-hmm. Uh, huge TV deals were made, and it put NWA on its heels. Uh, they had more widespread coverage in NWA. NWA was still basically fractured, but operating as there was no primary thing. They were NWAs all over the place. Right. Uh, they did what they could with character development whatnot to capture the hearts and souls of American youth. Like, kids like me, like, they did everything they could to, to get us interested. They had spectacular characters. They had great character development. Even their dumb characters were ones you wanted to see. Doink the Clown. Oh my fucking you wanted God. to see Doink the Clown. Like, I you, never wanted to see Doink the Clown. <laughs> I met. I know, but the I never wanted to see Doink the Clown. <laughs> Hey, come clown. on, Doink the Clown was freaking awesome. Oh, you don't like clowns. I don't like clowns. Okay. I, I love Doink the Clown. Uh, you can't argue that he did a lot for wrestling. Yeah, they expanded nationally. They sucked up a lot of talent independent companies across the nation. Um, when NWA's primary supercar, Starcade, was created, WWF created WrestleMania. Uh, and it's so funny. Because I've watched WrestleMania so many times, I don't think I've ever watched Starcade, but I know what it is. Oh no, I've seen Starcade. I've watched Starcade, and AWA had something for a short period. I don't remember what it was called though. Um, Vince coined the phrase "sports entertainment" to describe the sport. Uh, well, Andre was a giant in pro wrestling. Hulk Hogan entered the picture by 1984. Uh, Hulk's All American persona. His, his sheer size, his colorful character, made ratings soar. And I will tell you, I, one of the best things he does is entertain. He's not a super great technical wrestler. No. Not by any means. <laughs> um, no one will ever say he's the best wrestler. Well, there's some people who will, but it, really. Uh, the, the big leg drop was his finisher, and like I, I, I throw four or five leg drops in a match. Yeah, just, I mean, it's, it's just not, the way the business yeah. progressed. But I saw him on an independent show before he went to WWF and he was cutting a promo and he was freaking horrible. And I don't know who pulled him aside and taught him how to cut a promo. But somebody did. But someone did because his promos are what ended up helping WWF build to what it is today. All right, let me tell you something, brother. Let me tell you something, me, Gene. <laughs> uh, it's like, and no one could deny that. No. Like, you might not like Hulk Hogan. Boy, oh boy. But... But his promos were absolutely top shelf. And, and other people... I'm sorry. What? I was just thinking a couple like a couple years ago, like maybe like six years ago or so, I don't remember. It was a couple years ago. Hulk Hogan posted a tweet on his Twitter that was supposed to be a personal message to somebody, like a text message or something. And I just... That's what I think of when I think of Hulk Hogan. <laughs> What was it? I don't remember. Oh. But, like, also, all of his tweets are like, it's leg day, brother. Are you ready? Like, let's get pumped up. And, like, everything. Everything ends in brother. It's just, it's good. Like, drink your milk. Take your vitamins. His tweets are so funny. Yeah. Um, so, uh, pop culture became a huge part of WWF. Uh, they brought in music superstar, pop superstar, Cindy Lauper. Uh, and when we get to our next episode, where you and I call out some of our favorite wrestlers. We both had to pick two, which was nearly impossible. But uh, you will see how key she is to some of the greatest storylines that were ever in WWF, even though she was kind of a background thing and, and a distraction. Yeah. But uh, 
she made WWF appearances. Not only did she do that, but she brought WWF stars into her music videos, which gave them even more uh, exposure. And people who weren't really wrestling fans, who were her music fans, started watching wrestling because... Oh, who's in her video? The correlation. Uh, <coughs> the NWA territory started to collapse. Uh, some of the NWA promotions sold to Vince. Uh, Georgia Championship Wrestling, Maple Leaf Wrestling, Stampede Wrestling. Uh, Fritz Von Erich, big time wrestling with Drew from NWA and attempted to strike out on her own with WCCW, which I remember. Um, others joined up with uh, Memphis Continental Wrestling uh, Association. Yeah, good choice. Which later <laughs> became AWA. Um, this podcast is brought to you by Bear Claw Kitchen. Head on over to BearClawKitchen.com and check out their amazing selection of granola bars and granola snack packs. They also have hazel and spice granola butter, maple syrup, pancake mix, and a few different flavors of jam. So, once again, head over to BearClawKitchen.com and use code DELUXE15 at checkout to save 15% off your entire order. And then, it's time to devour and claw on. Uh, championship wrestling from uh, Florida Mid South Wrestling uh, tried to branch off on its own at Universal Wrestling Federation, which I also remember it did not last long. Uh, Jim Crockett Jr., who had taken over his father's Mid Atlantic territory in 1973, began to acquire control of remaining NWA territories, and he absorbed uh, championship wrestling from Florida Mid South Wrestling as well as promotions in Oklahoma and Kansas. Uh, he started to, like, there was some sharing of talent even outside of NWA because they were still kind of independent, but they were part of NWA. Uh, mm -hmm. So he started to, like, put the squeeze on his talent, not letting them strike out anywhere. Uh, Nature Boy Ric Flair uh actually drove promotions like Maple Leaf and Stampede into WWF's arms because they didn't have any big stars. Yeah. So, and he wasn't letting Nature Boy go up to Stampede and do his thing. So, they had no choice but to enter an alliance with Vince McMahon Jr. Right, because what else are you going to do with right. the guy who's pulling in most of your people isn't here anymore? If you don't have the draw, you just you not can't gonna... do anything. And when, when like, Stampede, when these people in Canada are seeing Ric Flair on TV in NWA and you, you're seeing Hulk and, and all them in WWF, and those people aren't ever coming to your promotion, like, they're going to tune out. So, yeah, exactly. Uh, Crockett went bankrupt in uh, 1988, and he sold the company to Ted Turner, who owned TBS Superstation. Which was a big thing because uh, Vince had like the grasp on all the national TV deals, so this gave you know Ted Turner an opportunity to take N NWA uh, and turn it into WCW, and um, I don't know. anyway, it, it was renamed uh, after that first show uh, from NWA to WCW. And WCW became one of the only real competitions at WWF then. NWA was no longer a competition because it had fractured so much. It was just small places all over the place. It was kind of the nail in the coffin. Right. Uh, they uh, became too mainstream for NWA to make a dent. Uh, when Saint Shane Douglas won the Eastern Championship Wrestling World title, as an NWA affiliate uh, in a tournament to crown a new champion following the departure of Ric Flair. Uh, he he could have, like Shane Douglas was a, a good wrestler. He was well known. He could have lifted NWA kind of up a little bit, but instead he threw the nail in the coffin. He threw the belt down and declared himself the ECW world champ. Why? Uh, it, they rebranded EC. Well, that that has to do with uh, some of the the uh, 
uh, people who were involved in the, the thinking, Vince Russo and uh, maybe not Vince Russo yet, but uh, who am I trying to think of? I don't know. He's he's a, he's a manager in WWF now. He used to own ECW. Paul Heyman. Paul Heyman. Yep. Yeah. So they rebranded uh, ECW to Extreme Championship Wrestling ECW, and he became the ECW World Champ. They withdrew from the NWA altogether. Uh, for much of the nineties, NWA re- re- relied on emerging combat sports stars and UFC champion Dan Severn. Uh, it's to, funny that he's the beast because that's also what they call uh, Paul Heyman's the guy that Paul Heyman was managing. I don't know if he still is, but it's probably Mac at it. Can't remember what his name is. Oh my uh, gosh, he has such a big forehead. <laughs> he's got a he's got such a big forehead. He's a five head. He does, and he he was the one that went and did a UFC fight. Oh, uh, you know. You know, take him to Suplex City. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's Suplex City, bitch. Uh, <laughs> I can't think of his freaking name. I, I'm just getting old. I can't think of his name. He has a big forehead. Yeah. So <laughs> Dan, having Dan Severn part of the NWA gave legitimacy to the... Cause he was a UFC champion. He was a legit fighter. And it's something they hadn't seen since Lu- Luthez. Yeah. Because Luthez was a legit fighter. Uh, during Dan Severn's brief reign, but he had a brief alliance with WWF. It, it didn't last long. It, it, it was, you blinked and it's gone. Yeah. Uh, ECW was a juggernaut for a short period of time. Like they grew, and, I, and, and in my opinion, and I have this written down here, they grew too big too fast. They were trying to compete with Vince and they, sh- what they should have been doing is just worried about themselves. Yeah. Uh, they brought fans of a new style of wrestling. That innovated the sport. It uh, it was unorthodox, uh, controversial storylines, bloodthirst, uh, and a lot of the, the demographic was eighteen to twenty five year olds. Uh, the the fan base was intensely rabid. Like uh, if you've ever been to an ECW show, it was crazy. It was crazy. They. Like at, at points, everybody in the, the crowd was throwing their chair into the ring, and, and that's why I want to say that I don't think the tank thing happened with WCW. I think it happened with ECW. I don't know. EC the, the end of ECW is very sad for me. Uh, but anyway, that hardcore style, that, like WWF tried to do a little bit of it, but they didn't want to delve too far. Uh, WCW was. Uh, I think a little more clean cut style. Yeah, WCW. That's why I'm thinking it was ECW too, because WCW was always it was always kind of more of like the the upper breath, you know. Yeah. Like it was always just it always seemed more like an actual championship style way to wrestle. Yeah. And I was not a big fan of WCW. I I'm more of a fan of it now than I was before, but. I grew up AWA, NWA, yeah. and WWF. Uh, WCW is kind of back burner for me. But ECW had, I think, one of the greatest rosters of all time. Ooh. You had the Sandman. You had Blue Meanie. You had Tommy, Tommy Dreamer, Dreamer. Sabu. Supernova. Rob Van Dam. New Jack. Conan. Bad Crew 1 and 2. My boys. The Bad Crew. Uh, Mikey Whipwreck. Raven. Ray Mysterio Jr., Ray Mysterio. Shane Douglas, Terry Funk. There's come back those names. Yeah. Freaking Taz. I love that. The Dudleys. Bubba Ray and Devon. Chris Jericho. Chris, Cactus Jack. You just made the list. I mean, it was crazy. Balls Mahoney. Sorry. Sonny started there. Little Guido. Chris Candido. Alex Rotten. Uh, Rocco Rock and Johnny Judge. God bless. Uh, Terry oh, Gordon. Man. I met both of these guys before. On time like that. Um, I, I just think they grew a bit too ambitious and grew way too fast. Right, you kind of—it's like when you put all your fuel on the fire right in the beginning. How do you sustain that? Well, I, I think there's no way to sustain. They had ECW Arena in Philly, and that place was packed every show they ran. 
And they started branching out, uh, Pennsylvania, Jersey, Delaware. But I think they, they started to go north. And I think that's where Vince felt it. He felt them kind of stepping on his dick a little bit. Yeah. And uh, Hammerstein Ballroom was, was a great venue for ECW wrestling. I love watching on TV there. Uh, when they got into pay-per-views, they were making some money. And I think uh, WWF started to take notice and said, hey, these guys are lurking in the shadows. We need to take care of that Take care of that before it gets too big. Yeah, because that's exactly how WWF looks at things. So at least then. It wasn't wow. until 2002 NWA got a, a reboot with Total Nonstop Action TNA. Are they still TNA? No. Because TNA still exists. Does it? Yes. I don't know. I know there was some management shuffling. I'm pretty sure it's TNA. There's another one that's on Tuesdays or Thursdays, or it used to be Tuesdays or Thursdays. And it was bouncing back and forth stations with WWE for a while. I'm pretty sure it's TNA. It's the one that, uh... I can't remember anybody's name now. I just, the, all the names left my brain as soon as I tried to say them. Well, TNA um, had... That's former, where the Hardy Boys were. They, yes, they were. They were in TNA. Uh, they, Jeff, so that still exists. Jeff Jarrett, AJ Styles. AJ Styles. So good. Raven, Christian, Sting. Sting. Uh, I think uh, uh, Mick Foley was there for a, a minute. That sounds right. I think Kurt Angle was there for a minute. That's the thing is a lot of WWF stars went back and forth. Yeah. Kind of like, mm, who's going to give me the better deal now? He wants me more. And uh, they they became... They, uh, and I think they kind of became a threat. And, and I think Vince did the same thing to them. Just undercut him every chance he got. Yeah. Uh, I don't know that for sure. That's just me. It, all these promotions, WWF, WCW, and ECW, were trying to outdo each other. They were the big three. Yeah, they were the show. When when I was wrestling, that's where everybody strived to go. Well, this is the '90s, so we're getting there. You know, yeah, '90s, early 2000s. Uh, w, WCW then began started poaching the WWF talent. Yeah, this is what I was just talking about. And WWF was started getting more violent, blood. Sex appeal to compete. That was sex the, appeal. That was the attitude era. The attitude era. Uh, so good. The Monday Night War started. This is it. Yeah. It was WCW. It was Nitro. That's right. Okay. Oh, th there was some. Whew, uh, there was some stuff that went on. Uh, they. Um, Enjoy the reading. Who's that? It's me. Oh. It's Mom and Lena. They. Uh, um, the one night during WWF. I guess they had a champion, and it was taped, and WCW went on and told everybody who, the who won the match. Oh, God. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. Uh, so I've watched a lot about uh, the Attitude Era and the Ruthless Aggression Era because I used to have WWE Network, and they have a bunch of free stuff on there. Like, if you have the $5, $10, or whatever it is well, now. We have Paramount, so you can still watch it. Or not right. Paramount. we got Peacock. Right. Peacock, Peacock has it on. <laughs> but they they had a lot of stuff up there. So while I had it, like I would I would pay the five dollars when there was a pay per view, yeah. and then we would put it from my computer onto the TV. Uh, but uh, I I remember watching a bunch of them. So there was WCW Monday Nitro, and that was set up to compete directly against Monday Night Raw. Absolutely. And I never thought it did until close to the end. You know when when I was paying more attention to WCW. Uh, there were some wrestlers on there that I really liked that I think that never really got their just desserts. They weren't really treated up to their talent. Um, Which is kind of why it all ended. Uh, they started fairly even. The war escalated in 96 with the formation of the heel stable, NWO. Uh, WCW started to get the upper hand. Uh they came up with more legitimate but edgy storylines and characters over what everybody considered WWF's cartoon style. Which is kind of how it was based on, you know, when when you look at the wrestlers that were popular in this era with WWF, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit more cartoon. Well, yeah. But it's not bad. I love it. You had the, gobble, the love gobbledygooker. Yeah. Like, come on, the Bastion Booger. Yep. 
And then, I mean, you also had, you know, some tag teams that were getting pretty edgy. They were, they were kind of, I mean, I never, I feel like all tag teams are kind of cartoony. <laughs> what? It's like kind of part of the gimmick of being in a tag team is you're, you, you have another person that you have to now make a show with. I don't you know? understand why you're shitting on tag teams. I'm not shitting on them. I think they're great. I think it's part of what makes them great because you have to... What's the word? You have to do stuff on the spot. You know? With, with somebody else. Without getting too deep into the weeds, uh, tag team wrestling, like, when you have a wrestling match, and when we, we were training wrestlers, we were teaching this. If you're having a singles match, how many people are involved in a match? Everyone. How, to, how many? All of your fans. <laughs> You've heard me say this before. I have absolutely not, but when you look at the reason why storylines and stables fail, it is because they do not have the backing of the fans. Right. Regardless if you are babyface or heel, you have to play your role well. So, you have... You have Two, Improvisation. Two That's people in a match. You're improvising more. And you have a referee. Right. And maybe you have a manager. Right. So there's four people right there. And then the fifth, to me, is the crowd. Right. So if all of those things aren't working together, the it's match won't against work. You. So now you have a tag team and you're adding two more people. And it makes it more complex in a way. And like so, people always say, "Well, it's easier being a tag team." Well, no, it's not, because you have to. It also depends on what kind of person you are. You have to deal with. You, know, you got to know your partner. You got to know the other team, even if you've never met them before. You got to know what they're going to do. You got to know how they're going to play it. If they're baby faced or heels, if you're a baby face or heel, you have to like. Mm -hmm. Me and Lovebug always said the, the one of the greatest shows we ever worked. There are two of them. We had to be escorted from the building by the police for our own safety. Like the the police. Well, you know when you're a heel. Yeah, we made a heel turn in Emmaus of all places, Emmaus, Pennsylvania. And we did a heel turn there. Monday, Monday, Monday. We had they had to have the Emmaus police come and take us to our cars and follow us out of town. Like, excuse me, you're in danger. <laughs> Everybody here hates you. Yes. We're going to kill you. <laughs> so, um, WCW at this time finally sold out to WWE March 2001. ECW was having huge financial issues and filed for bankruptcy in April of 2001. Uh, and, he, and WWF eventually bought them out too. And the reason he bought them out is he wanted to buy out the contracts, keep the people he wanted, and discard the people that he didn't want. He didn't want. Yeah. Um, but when this happened, there was no real competition left in the pro wrestling industry. But WWF got all of those stables from other places and tried also incorporating them into their storylines and eventually replaced most of those wrestlers with their own big wrestlers in the stables. Yeah. Because I at that point, with everybody else gone, it doesn't really matter, you know who the wrestlers are if they're not working in WWF just the stable is the name that people know I personally believe this downfall of pro wrestling I would have to agree but I see yeah. we're coming up on a list of some pretty great I you would call them indie well, yeah now with, still the, with, with them acquiring WCW and ECW it left a huge gap in demand for uh, the Lucha Libre style the Japanese style, the hardcore style of wrestling, which WWF doesn't offer on a regular basis. Yeah. ECW did in, in, in droves. Uh, WCW gave you some of the more Lucha Libre style. Uh, so Because they were very clean cut. Yeah. And that's the safest way to do Lucha, in my opinion. So That's the safest way to do high-flying stuff is if you're clean. Oh, yeah. So scary. <laughs> so good, though. So uh, there was alternatives to step up and, and cash in on this niche market, uh, started to gain more exposure. Impact Wrestling, uh, Ring Impact of Honor. Impact is good. Ring of Honor is great. CZW fulfilled the hardcore. Yeah, CZW. Uh, Chikara, which gave you the Japanese and the Lucha styles. Yep. Maryland Championship Wrestling. 
Uh, oh, what's this one down here? Uh, what are, is that Pro uh, Excitement Wrestling? What is, uh, what's Pro Excitement Wrestling with four exclamation points? It's, <laughs> it's, it's one of the least known of all of them. Uh, please visit our website. <laughs> it's not up anymore. Uh, I remember when, uh, when we were still doing the, uh, the, uh, dial-up internet here. Mm. You just open up that internet and right there is the page. Uh, so, even now, to this day, there's still an al- uh, a, a need for an alternative, and All Elite or AEW. AEW is so good, and I do I do enjoy AEW, uh, and that started up in 2019, and that kind of brings us to present day. Uh, Ring of Honor is really made an insert resurgence. Ring of Honor, yeah, is baller. Uh, and, and it's cool because some of the guys that I train. Yeah, or going through to these places on on some of these these places and and succeeding and I'm, I'm happy for them. Yeah. Um but that's the modern spirit pro wrestling. Yeah, I think that that mostly brings us up to current day, and I think that I think there's a lot that you can look back on in the history of wrestling from 1908 to now just because since I wasn't here for the last one. You can look back and you can see kind of like where things come from in the industry now. Did you watch like where they started or listen to the last one? No. Okay. So did you did I talk to you about any of the stuff that I researched? You you weren't feeling well, so I No, I don't think so. So just to touch on that again, do you know how far back wrestling goes? I am going to have to say wrestling is a gladiatory sport. Which means that it would have to be Colosseum age. It goes back to Genesis. Oh, boy. The beginning of time, everybody. Yes, that's, that's how we started it. <laughs> the beginning of time. Uh, Long ago, in a land far, far away. And I, I, I made the comment when I, I read this that, of course, the Bible, is, the Bible shows symbolism all the time. Right. And there's another passage before this one where they mention wrestling, but it was... One hundred percent symbolic, and it was it was the wrestling of of uh, social stuff. Not right. this actually talks this about physically. a physical match. So even if it's symbolic, they're using that symbolism to describe what happened here, right? And and that's a physical wrestle. Yeah. So could not overcome. That means that it was physical. My next entry is seven seventy six BC. Right. So that's the Olympic yeah. Games. <laughs> <laughs> so you know. Professional wrestling has long, long, long roots, and I think it'll be around for a l- much longer time. I just don't think it will ever be. It'll never be as big as, as big it as it was in like the early part of the nineteenth century. Yeah, and in the la- latter part of the nineteenth century, yeah. it's never going to be that big again. I don't think. I don't think so. And, until someone steps up and can be a head-to-head, I, the company com- just needs to bring back. All of this garbage. <laughs> the Monday Night Wars. Monday think, Night Wars are why people turned on their TVs on Mondays. Yes. Like, pe- just people. Anybody. The Monday Everybody Night Wars was watching them. forced WCW to be more creative. It forced WWF to be more creative. The minute that they brought out WCW, the creativity of WWF spiraled. Yeah. Like, the storylines were Because they have nothing else. They, yeah. they still are. Like <laughs> There was nothing to push them. <laughs> there are still really, really bad storylines. There are really good ones. The problem is, there are so many bad storylines with so many good, talented wrestlers that could be doing something better someplace else. But because nobody is competing with WWE the way that WCW and ECW did, yep. they will never have that chance because nobody... I shouldn't say nobody. Very rarely is somebody who is still in their prime making as much money as they can at WWE. I almost said F. <laughs> at WWE, most of those people are not going to leave. Because if you're on the main roster, like if you're on the main card for the roster, there's no reason to. You're on every week, you're on every show. Right. And you get paid for that. And they know what it's like to not be the main roster for a show, and they don't want that again. No, no. So it sucks. It sucks that you know, like the people are kind of 
trapped in maybe bad contracts. Maybe they don't want to be there. And I feel like a lot of people after they leave WWE, and I mean, like they're leaving it or they're fired or whatever. So obviously they're going to have something to say about it. But there's just a lot of stuff that goes on where it's like they don't give people fair chances, like da 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 da. And it's because they don't have any competition. They don't have anybody pushing them right. to be better. They don't have anybody pushing their writers to be better. And I think somebody should just bring back, you know, just some of these nice promotions. Just make them bigger. Well, I think if... I wish that that could happen. And I know that it's difficult. If, it's, if somebody was smart, and I don't want to say Vince, because he obviously built a, a billion-dollar company. I do not think he is in charge of the company anymore. I think it's all gone to Triple H. Or no. most of it has. I don't and, think that's just a figurehead anymore. And Triple H was never... I, I, I was never a fan. Never <sighs> a fan of Triple H. I like Triple H. And I like... There's... So, okay. He's married to Stephanie McMahon now, right? They're married. I sent them a wedding gift, by the way. Did you really? What did you send them? <laughs> just, they had they had a wedding registry. Just some kip, kitchen implements. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. From all, probably, the, from all the guys at PXW. They're probably still using them. <laughs> like... Oh, those great gentlemen over at PXW, I hope they're doing well. <laughs> Meanwhile, here we are. But I, I feel like things have... I shouldn't say that I think things have gotten better since he's kind of taken the reins, but there was some stuff that was going on right before Vince stepped down, and everybody was just like, we cannot abide by this anymore. I cannot abide. No. So I really think that is the problem ultimately, and I think that's what needs to happen. I wish that Ring of Honor could be more mainstream. Well, AEW, I, wish... I think, is doing a good job of uh, competing. Yeah, AEW, I think, is at this point the closest thing that we have to a good competitor. Because while they're still they're still bringing in some of the the, the names, you got Chris Jericho. Is he still there? I don't know if he is or not. I actually don't know where Chris Jericho is right now. Um, but he was there for a while. You had, you know, but now they have young guys coming up and they're making these young guys the stars. And I like that. I do too. I, I love that. I love seeing these young guys get a shot. I think it's great to have veterans on your card. I think it's great, you know, but what I think is more, I think it's perfectly great to give them the respect that they deserve because they've been in the industry, but I think it's important for them to realize also this is, is not going to be their industry forever. Yeah. You know, like, unfortunately, when you hit a certain age, you kind of, you're either in really, really good shape or you have to age out, you know? And I feel like it's also on them, it's part of their responsibility as a veteran in the industry to help these new people, help these new stars, these this rising talent. I think it's part of their responsibility to kind of just their responsibility to the industry yeah. to say, Hey, let me give you a hand. Like, let me teach you because, and I mean, it's, it's sad, but I, I guess like the less and less that you have that happening, the less and less you're going to see people coming up like the rock who comes from a family in the line. Yeah. Uh, Charlotte Flair, obviously. You're going to see less people like that where it's like, oh, I'm taking up this mantle. Because, I mean, they run promotions like that where it's not actual family. Right. That's a a big popular thing for them to do with promotions is... Well, the, the Polynesian thing, every all the Polynesian the uncles. Can we just... No. The Rock, the, please the, don't the talk Hana. to them. <laughs> don't talk to them, please. <laughs> You're making yourself look bad. I want your shoes. The Rock has $100 shoes. 150. No, they were 100 in my size. Ninety nine, ninety nine on dicks. I love looking at dicks. <laughs> it has very, very good deals. Dicks has good deals all the time. Where's John when you need him? <laughs> well, John's not here. That's why I had to say it. So, anyway. I need the rock shoes. That's well, moving on from dicks. Culmination of this, of this episode. Uh, we took on... The long, long history of pro wrestling in two episodes. Two episodes. And now you go take on the world. Our podcasts exist because of listeners like you. To find other great shows, head over to the Den Dot Show. Thanks for listening.
Hold on, stop. Welcome back to the shit show 2.0. Okay, boomer. Damn millennials. Wow. <laughs> Did not know that. Even flippers who who are obviously mentally ill. You wanna be my wife? Oh, this is gonna go downhill real quick. <laughs>